Metro Last Light is a post-apocalyptic first-person shooter set in the ruins of post-World War III, Moscow. The game, in much the same vein as its predecessor, Metro 2033, uses a variety of outdoor, indoor, and underground areas, and allows you to experiment in many of these well-constructed levels with a much improved stealth mechanics, gun combat, and so forth. As I mentioned in the previous video, this is the second of a three-part series focusing on the entirety of the Metro games. I would recommend, if you're interested in watching this video, to head back to my previous video on 2033, as I'll frequently be calling back to it and referencing some of the key points that I made throughout. But interestingly, I don't think that it's entirely necessary to know the beat-for-beat -beat points of the last game, but it'll definitely bolster your interest and help solidify the main narrative arc of the story. Uh, this video will be broken up into several chapters, and I'll have a table of contents in the description box below to allow for easier navigation through the video, and to allow you to jump around to the various sections. But I want to forewarn you, this video is not easy watching. I go to great lengths to, within my own capabilities, really analyze and dissect Metro Last Light. There is going to be a lot of references for you here that may be unfamiliar, and I hope that you watch this with an open mind. Specifically, the first chapter of this video is not easy viewing. I discuss the Russian occupation of Crimea, briefly, ideology, psychoanalysis, and Hegelian philosophy. And for a lot of you watching, this may seem overly excessive, uh, but frankly, I want to provide a different spin on the gaming analysis videos that many of you have likely seen. I've seen a lot of them too, and I love them. But I don't want to be trite and repetitive, I want to see how we can think through video games as an object of analysis. And I think Metro is a really good case study here. This video is an experiment. An experiment in games analysis using philosophy and political theory and psychoanalysis. I hope that it's a worthwhile experiment and that you're able to get something from it. I am adding here a disclaimer and a brief preface to this video because I think it's necessary for those of you watching. The first chapter of this video is briefly a foray into recent history. This part of the video does not directly tie in with the mechanical or narrative elements of the game, but I think provides an important context for analysis and more closely dissecting Metro Last Light as a piece of art. And that point is huge. I think uh, that provides a baseline for this channel as a whole. I love video games, I wouldn't spend hours, days, and weeks working on these videos if I didn't. But I also think of games as an art form, a medium that deserves careful critique and analysis. Beyond simply talking about the structure of the game, I'll be applying a variety of lenses, typically literary, political, philosophical, and or psychoanalytic, to help us deconstruct this game, what it's doing, and how we can learn from it as a piece of art. This is important because games, as a medium and as an analytic object, function in a purely self-referential manner, or with some vague reference to the cinematic nature of the art form. All of this can be true, but it doesn't necessarily take us that step forward in trying to earnestly talk about games and do some fair analysis. In August of 2014, Metro Last Light Redux was released. An updated version of 4A Games is Metro Last Light, which was released in 2013. 4A Games is a development studio that was, over the course of the development of the Redux edition of the game, headquartered in Kiev, Ukraine. Now, immediately that should ring some bells. In February of 2014, Crimea was forcefully occupied by armed Russian forces and annexed. Now, I won't have an entirely long section on the ins and outs of this specific conflict, but I do think it's important to have this operating as a backdrop for our conversation, specifically because the Metro series goes to great lengths to critique the varying incarnations of ideology. In the first two Metro games alone, we have three factions who are, to a greater or lesser extent, so ideologically grounded that they must rely on an exterior force to help seed their ideology. They must create a phantasmatic structure, some encompassing grand narrative, that postulates and defines a subject in relation to some exterior force. Now, I know I just said a lot of words there, but let's use some examples from the game to help define exactly what I mean. In the first two Metro games, we have three competing factions. The Red Line, the Nazis, and the Order. We, the players controlling Artyom from the subjective position of the Order, are led down the path in Metro 2033 of seeing the Dark Ones as an existential threat 
to the continued survival of humanity. We are led to this position by Hunter, and the position is consistently reinforced by the NPCs that we implicitly trust. It leads us to commit, in the canonical ending, a radically inhuman act. It leads us to wipe out an entire species, to lead the Dark Ones to extermination, or, as we'll learn throughout the course of Metro Last Light, the very brink of extinction. But let's return to that last point that I was making about ideology, and let's use some psychoanalytic terminology to help break this down. The Red Line is driven by its desire to realize its bastardized form of communism. But this realization requires the dispensation of unspeakable atrocities in order to fully realize this future. This effectively functions as a critique of the Stalinist Soviet Union. In their unwavering desire to materialize communism, they will utilize whatever means necessary to accomplish this goal. And we're going to see this uh, last point that I made in an especially climactic moment about halfway through the story of Last Light. The Nazis are the Nazis, and they suck ass, and it's cool that you get to kill them, in-game, of course. But it's important to understand why they are able to gather a foothold in this post-apocalyptic society. Because they provide a narrative, some type of fidelity for the displaced and lost souls of the Metro. We need to understand the horrifying and tragic context that we're working with in the Metro games. Humanity has been driven underground, is starving and dying. We have destroyed our homes, our families, and our loved ones. We killed and maimed and caused irreparable damage to the only place that we can call home, and while we never see what caused the dropping of the bombs, what led us to the point of mutually assured destruction, we can infer that it is precisely the unconscious stranglehold of ideology. The ending of Metro 2033 confirms this. Artyom kills the Dark Ones because he viewed them as an existential threat. His ideology demanded such position. The Nazis, in much the same way, rely on some alien force to provide the consistency of their identity. This was the function of the Jewish people for the Nazis during World War II. The Nazis sought the extermination of all quote-unquote impure peoples because it is the means by which accomplishing their own utopic racially pure society. At the end, some utopia in the realm of the Nazi mythos lies just beyond the edge of the hill. Uh, but this is an obviously, and in the case of the Nazis, ridiculously evil falsity that must exist to provide some goal, some justification. The Order is a little bit trickier to deconstruct, specifically because in the role of Artyom, we have a vested interest and stake in their success, we're even told at the beginning of Last Light that Artyom is now considered one of their best, a legacy hero who paved the way for the success of the Order. But we must ask, what does the Order protect? In very vague notions, they protect humanity from all threats. But for the Order to mean anything, for the Order to justify its very existence, there needs to be that crucial threat. Here enters the Dark Ones. Humanity and the Order did not and does not understand them, but they provide that external antagonistic foe, that sustained identity of the Order. They justified whatever means necessary in the elimination of the Dark Ones, and by any means that means succumbing to the same temptation that brought the world to its knees. Now, I want to say quickly that I'm not someone who believes in horseshoe theory. I have a particular political affinity that influences my own writings and beliefs. Some of these uh, factions have legitimately noble goals, and others are a form of pure evil, and if you can't tell which one I think is which, I would recommend going back to my previous line where I said that it's cool and good that we get to kill Nazis. But with each of these ideological frames, we need to do a considerable bit of abstraction to see how they are all internally organized around a supplemental external quote-unquote enemy, something that cannot be initiated or ingratiated into that ideological apparatus. We're going to use some Lacanian terminology here, a term that I used in my previous video on Metro 2033, but that I deliberately did not define in order to save that for this analysis. The real. 
The real in Lacan is a surplus in a fantasy structure that defines the coordinates and limitations of that structure. It is something that cannot be integrated into the structure without fundamentally destroying it. And the real constitutes our subjectivity and where we are positioned on an ideological plane. The best way to look at the real is like a fundamental constitutive contradiction. That which we consider to be furthest from us is indelibly stained in our ideological position. It structures who we are as subjects. All of the ideological systems that I mentioned previously, when abstracted, are structured around the same real, something that cannot be brought into the ideological system without destroying it. And if that form of the external enemy were to disappear, irrelevant to whatever the content is, so would the very fidelity that it provides. The Order, the Reds, the Nazis, are all structured around the form of an external enemy. Artyom is powerful because, in the case of the Order, he is their pride and joy, but he is also the chosen one for the Dark Ones. The Dark Ones selected him to be the bridge. This is where I think the Metro series does such a phenomenal job at showing, and this is a statement that needs to be qualified and may absolutely contradict with your own beliefs, the structure of being, but only insofar as it shows the function of desire and its linkage with ideology. Metro Last Light is radical because it allows us to, and I'll be quoting here Todd McGowan from his book The Impossible David Lynch, experience a familiarity in what is completely unfamiliar. What, to Artyom, is any more unfamiliar, unexplainable, and completely unknowable than the Dark Ones. He was the bringer of their doom, the slaughterer of their people. And now, in a series of very weird things that I've just said, I'm going to say something very weird. And it probably won't make a ton of sense, but I hope to qualify this as the video goes on. Metro Last Light and 2033 are some of the most Hegelian games I've ever played. Okay, the ones who shut off the video should be gone now. What I mean by that statement has everything to do with the Absolute. To quote McGowan again, the position of the Absolute, which is where Hegelian philosophy always ends up, involves the subject seeing what it can't see, what Hegel calls the negative of itself, or its limit. All right, you might be saying, but what does this philosophy shit have to do with my post-apocalyptic video game? This philosophy shit has everything to do with the radicality of Artyom and the Baby Dark One. Why, you may ask? Because one of the premier functions of ideology, as you may have noticed, is to create volatile oppositions, where there exists a contradiction. The Order produces the opposition between humanity and the Dark Ones, and at the end of Metro 2033, you follow that oppositional ideological force to its limit. But Metro Last Light sees you fully partaking in and embodying that contradiction. Artyom moves as the Absolute, the contradictory force that does not seek to paper over the contradiction with opposition, but instead fully takes charge of the contradiction producing some new reality from that. He does not see the Baby Dark One as something totally opposed to himself, but he sees himself in the otherness. He does not see the Dark One as some substantial entity, but something that is subject and equally as divided and conflicted as he is. It is the foundation of truly egalitarian relations. And, as we should see by now, this critique of ideology has dramatic implications for the Russo-Ukrainian conflict. Metro Last Light, and the Metro series as a whole, should be seen as an affirmation of collectivity and solidarity. But it also attempts to destabilize ideological apparatuses. As we've seen, ideology can lead to mass exterminations, death squads, and even the banal, unforeseen horror. It may lead you to the beginning of armed conflict and the recapitulation of irreducible global tensions. I love Children of Men. It's a beautiful, sprawling, epic film from director Alfonso Cuaron. I love the characters and the world. I love how fleshed out and lived in everything feels. 
I love how it perfectly exemplifies an authentically late capitalist neoliberal hellscape. But on a technical level, I love the way that the camera moves. I'm not saying that to sound overly pompous, no, I think there's a fluidity to the camera that does two things for that film. One, it immerses the viewer totally in the world, using wide lenses to capture the scale of this catastrophic future, and as a sub-point to this, it, too, acts like a character in its own right. The camera often gets distracted in Children of Men. It'll pan from Leo over to a cage filled with immigrants and refugees. It'll watch the TV. It moves organically and picks up small details from the world. It uses this technique to build atmosphere and tell subtle stories that are occurring adjacent and sometimes unrelated to the main plot. I think the Metro series adopts much of this same attitude and technical ethos of Children of Men. I pointed out in the last video on 2033 that the world of the Metro feels like a character in its own right. The last Light doubles down on this aesthetic and coherently structures its morality system around this engagement with immersion. In 2033, the morality system felt like it wanted to say something, to make some type of point about player choice, subjectivity, and the horrors and beauty of the Metro, but it always seemed to fall short. Last Light, I think, fully realizes the potential of its morality system. It also contradicts a comment I made in my previous video. I said that 2033 was unable to shed its linear framework, and while I think that holds for Last Light as well, I think it uses its linear narrative to build these resounding, intoxicating atmospheres. More so than in 2033, I felt myself thoroughly sucked into the world, characters, and atmosphere of Last Light. This was accomplished by successful tweaks in storytelling and narrative design that allowed players to assume the subjective position of Artyom. And this is all the more masterful when you consider that Artyom is essentially reliving, and we are replaying, the events of 2033. The beat-to-beat -beat story progression has some fascinating structural similarities to 2033, which we'll talk about below, but most importantly to Last Light is that Artyom feels proactive in this game. He feels like a character. The conflict that we only received glimpses of at the end of 2033 is the starting position of Last Light. Also, one of my biggest complaints of 2033 was its fundamental lack of characters. Last Light makes up for this with the inclusion of new key players that provide an actual emotional object to the story. To put it simply, in Metro 2033, it felt like things simply happened to Artyom. He was never directly inculcated in much of the game's story. Only at the end does Artyom have to assume some burden, something which he carries and which weighs heavy on him, the extinction of the Dark Ones. Last Light has Artyom fully assuming that starting, regretful position and struggling with his moral fidelity and his loyalty to Miller and the Order. We also interact with some of the best traveling companions in the series, but we'll get to that in time. For now, we're going to go through the story of Metro Last Light, but we're going to do so much more methodically than in the last video. I want to set up how exactly the game positions Artyom and the player to assume the position of the Absolute, to identify contradiction, and to begin some critical examination of ideology. Metro Last Light begins with an opening monologue from Artyom, detailing the events of the previous game. Importantly, it confirms that the canonical ending that Last Light occurs in the wake of is with the death of the Dark Ones. Metro Last Light properly begins with a dream sequence that sets up many of the atmospheric and thematic principles that the game will explore. Artyom sits in a tunnel with unnamed soldiers. They're on guard duty. They drink and wait. Further down the tunnel, a second outpost can be seen, their fire burning dimly in the darkness of the tunnels. A scream is heard. Gunshots. The Dark Ones. They haunt Artyom's dreams. But not because of their horror, or their brutality, uh, but almost melancholically. The soldiers around you turn into attacking Nosalis. You shoot them down, 
reverting into their former human bodies. Artyom is gunning down man and beast alike. A Nosalis charges at Artyom and he plunges his knife into its skull. The Nosalis turns into another man. Artyom cradles him and slowly lays him down on the ground. He stares at his bloodied hands. A dark one reaches out and he wakes up. What does this dream tell us? It's a striking opening, and it's more emotionally resonant than the in-media res of Storming the Tower in 2033. All of the murder from the previous game, outside of but including the Dark Ones, haunts him. Artyom killed, and he suffers from PTSD. The weight he carries is heavy and burdensome. Artyom wakes up in D6. Khan has sneaked in. He knows that you're still dreaming of the Dark Ones. He says that one lives. It's in the nest. It needs to be found and protected. Ullman escorts Khan to Miller, and you're left for some time to wander D6. The facility is enormous, and the Order has grown considerably since you've last seen them. Recruits sit and play instruments and talk of their exploits. There's also some great environmental storytelling here that seamlessly blends in with later in-game environments. Like these two guys here, who talk about the swamp, and how a man ventured from the red flags and was eaten. Later, when you enter the swamps, if you listen to that conversation, you will be clutching onto those flags for dear life. There's a lot of excellent moments like this where subtle environmental storytelling also serves to provide the player with key gameplay information, as well as fleshing out the world and lore of the Metro. There's also another conversation in the mess hall where some men discuss the closed-off portions of D6 containing strange and dark forces behind them. Little pieces of information like this pay off in a really nice way later on, and you could completely miss these sections. Again, the team at 4A wants to make you that wandering camera from Children of Men. They want to provide you with morality points if you thoughtfully engage with their world. Artyom meets up with Miller and Khan. Khan informs Miller of the Dark One, and Miller enlists Artyom and his daughter Anna to eliminate the Dark One. Khan begs Artyom not to kill him. Artyom is most definitely conflicted based on his journal entries and his dialogue. As a small side detail, Miller also informs two rangers to search for a missing ranger named Lesnitsky. This opening section does a lot of legwork in setting up the key beats of the story, and paves the way for some interesting twists later on. Anna and Artyom travel to the surface. This small section familiarizes players with the pace and flow of combat. You are attacked by a pack of Nosalis, picking them off one by one. Eventually, the Dark One appears. It is a child. You chase after it while Anna shoots from a further position. You eventually catch the Dark One, but it shows you a vision. You watch from the perspective of the Dark Ones, on the ground, as they are decimated by your missile strike. And you watch as this very child scurries away to safety. This also introduces another key theme of the Metro series, brought forward with this game specifically. I think as an homage to the book Metro 2034, is perspectival shifts and the subjectivity of evil. The Dark One's true gifts, their raw power, is in this ability to tap into the unconscious, to make it spill forth. I'll touch on this some more later. You wake up and the baby Dark One has been locked in a cage. You're surrounded by Nazis. They knock you out and you're dragged into an interrogation chamber. In this interrogation chamber, you watch as the Nazis do phrenology and interrogate some captured Reds. They kill two people before one of the captured red soldiers creates a diversion, and you and him are able to escape. His name is Pavel, and his introduction is one of the most genuinely endearing in the series. He seems trustworthy and respectable, and you work with him to escape the Nazi camp. You navigate the camp and get your first proper stealth tutorial. I mentioned previously that stealth in 2033 had very few actual repercussions, but here in Last Light, stealth means something. If you kill haphazardly and without any foresight, you will quickly lose moral points, but also the levels have been specifically designed to facilitate a greater emphasis on stealth. The game even reacts and builds a mythos around Artyom. Soldiers will idly chat about the crazed ranger who has killed so many of their comrades. 
This is especially noticeable in the ambush section later in the game, where if you sneak around, you will hear the soldiers talking about you. Artyom and Pavel take out more guards, and can, if you pay careful attention to environmental cues from the locked prisoners, start a breakout which the game will react to uh, during the Fuhrer's speech. The duo sneaks through an assembly held by the Oppenfuhrer. He discusses his plans to overtake D6. There are food and supplies that will prove beneficial for their cause, and they're prepared to take it by force. Pavel creates another distraction, and the two are chased by soldiers. Artyom is shot, and Pavel carries Artyom to the safety of the railcar. We are meant to, from this point forward, trust Pavel. And it's easy to. He's a genuinely likable character. He's charming and resourceful, making what happens later all the more powerful. It also adds real stakes to the narrative, and we as players are now personally invested. Artyom and Pavel escape by railcar, but Pavel is quickly captured by Reich soldiers. Artyom must navigate through a stealth combat gauntlet to save Pavel. In a game filled with great levels, this is easily one of my favorites, and on higher difficulties it prioritizes resourceful thinking, careful planning, and instinctual play. If you're caught on the higher difficulties, the likelihood of surviving the ensuing gunfights are slim. This game, depending on the difficulty, can be far more unforgiving than 2033. I often found that if I didn't play cautiously and carefully, I would find myself out of bullets, out of grenades, and out of luck. As I mentioned previously, this level of the game effectively functions as a gauntlet to test your skills. The levels, as opposed to the design of 2033, are much more open and accommodating for stealth gameplay. This footage of the game that you're watching is from my most recent playthrough, where I tried to accommodate a healthy balance of stealth and gunplay. I played through Last Light three times, clocking my total playtime at just shy of 50 hours. These sections are so cleverly designed that on each subsequent playthrough, I was excited to run through this gauntlet again to explore new nooks and crannies, and see just how versatile and accommodating the level design actually was. When pitted against other stealth action games like the Far Cry series, Tomb Raider, and Assassin's Creed, Metro is undoubtedly the most polished and versatile of this bunch. The stealth gameplay isn't overly deep to the point of being overwhelming, as I've often found myself when playing games like Hitman, and it isn't overly shallow like the aforementioned Tomb Raider and Uncharted series. I think the game that comes closest to capturing the gameplay and mood of Metro are the newest Wolfenstein games. Stealth is an option in both of these games, but Metro makes it narratively and mechanically compelling to prioritize stealth as the first option, especially when, narratively, the stakes have been set high for Artyom. He feels regret for his killings. They haunt him. And it appeared to me that he wanted to make amends for that. With Artyom, there is also a significant degree of role-playing that will help to subtly shape the character that you play. Is Artyom vengeful and vindictive, or is he forgiving? He will never explicitly state how he feels, so this absent of protagonist voice leaves an opening for subjectivity to emerge. Again, that very sentiment seems to contradict an entire chapter of my previous video on the absent protagonist that is Artyom, but I think it's ultimately a testament to the strength of the Metro series that it was able to take the robust liveliness of the Half-Life games, with its rule to never strip you away from the action, and make that an integral part of crafting Artyom. There is a moment later on in the game that opened a pathway for my own player subjectivity to emerge, with the specific Artyom that I was building. Ultimately, you navigate through the gauntlet and save Pavel. You have both helped one another, and it becomes quite clear that an intimate bond seems to be forming between these two. And this is all carried by Pavel's excellent voice acting, which seems to grow more personable and intimate as these levels progress. The duo escapes further into the tunnels. This area is infested with spiders and other creepy arachnids that must be repelled through your flashlight which burns through their armor and which finally flips them over, leaving them exposed on their bellies. These enemies appeared in Metro 2033, but there was never any ceremonious introduction. They simply appeared. You spend the rest of the level navigating through these spider-infested tunnels, charting a path towards the surface. You eventually escape. Pavel is attempting to take Artyom to Theater Station. From Theater Station, Artyom will be able to quickly travel to Polis and notify the Order that the Nazis plan to storm the bunker and that the Dark One has been captured. While on the surface, Artyom and Pavel find the remains of a commercial plane from before the war. Pavel and Artyom enter the plane to investigate it. It is only through the plane that they can head to Theater Station. The two wander in, and from the moment I stepped in, the ground felt rotten. 
and felt dark. I was in a game, but the atmosphere was so overwhelming that when the first flashes appeared, I legitimately jumped in my seat. This scene is so nail-bitingly effective. You are flashbacked to the moment the bombs fell. You're in the cockpit with the pilots. They scream. The co-pilot cries, prays, begs for mercy. You wake up. Some time has passed. Pavel is clawing for fresh air with his gas mask off. It's an intense moment that really touches on how unsettling the Metro universe is. This might seem bland or obvious, but the idea that the world replays the last twinkling moments of existence is sublime in its horror. Travelers, wanderers, stalkers must navigate the hostile new world, but must also avoid being trapped in the remains of the old one. The world leaves these imprints of perspectival horror to highlight the precise moment that humanity failed, playing on a loop for all would-be scavengers to experience. This is something that is unique to the post-apocalyptic horror of the Metro series, the veritable footprint left by the ghosts of the bombs. It's as if the shadows of Hiroshima took shape and form, as if those blown away in the blast were unable to find any peace or solace. They simply have to relive the final moments of their existence in a kaleidoscopic reel of trauma. I remember when I first saw the shadows of Hiroshima. The photograph of the man and his cane etched onto the ground in which he stood. The plants seamlessly copied onto walls. There was this brief moment of awe, but the awe immediately turned into disgust and melancholia. They were horrifying to look at. When I see them now, it still brings a tear to my eye. They act as living reminders shadows of what we once were, vaporized in a moment of nuclear hellfire. The devastation of the blast in the metro was enough to actualize these last few moments, rather than the very last instant. The plot of the metro games in these moments simply stops for me. Everything feels so small and inconsequential in the context of this land brought to waste. A wasteland. Metro is one of these few games where the actual palpable horror and devastation of nuclear holocaust retains its really truly traumatic dimension. Fallout makes the wasteland seem habitable and inconsequential in comparison. Here in the Metro, there is no escape from the sins of the past. Artyom and Pavel fight their way through more of the surface, nearly being overwhelmed by Nosalis and Watchmen before retreating into the safety of the theater station. Here, you're given time to walk around while Pavel secures paperwork for your travel to Polis. You take in more of the station, listen to auxiliary conversations, and can soak in the world of the theater station. You can also take in a nice show that lasts a whopping 10 minutes. Again, 4A Games' fidelity towards the fleshing out of the world feels so unique and novel in these games, I just can't help but smile in appreciation. Eventually, Artyom and Pavel stop for a meal and a drink before they head off, but Pavel betrays you. He's actually a high-ranking official with the Reds and has you arrested. It's a pretty good twist and it does an excellent job in giving Artyom stakes in the story, and makes the player feel invested. You also meet the D6 trader Lesnitsky, who has stolen a weapon from D6 and smuggled it to the Red Line. As of this point in the story, Artyom doesn't know what the Reds' plans are. You're saved by a nice young communist, and you sneak your way through the facility. You learn that Lesnitsky is being sent with a team of soldiers to attack the Rangers' base of operations and execute another plan. Here we have another stealth combat gauntlet as you work your way through the Reds' base of operations. You escape and are saved by Andrew the Blacksmith. This begins one of my favorite sections in the entire game. Artyom drives a rail car named Regina. It's an on-rail sequence, quite literally, as you drive the car, but there are so many different rooms that you can stop in and explore that it feels like the beginning of Fourier Games' experimentation with broader game design. It feels like a soft template for Metro Exodus, in that you have a linear path that you can explore and complete rather quickly, but there are a lot of little side objectives and so on that you can just explore. After this section, you encounter a group of traveling refugees escaping the Red Line. They're stuck. Their forward party hasn't reported back, and they're not sure what awaits them ahead. Artyom investigates. A group of bandits have positioned themselves up ahead to ambush unexpecting caravans. This is one of the few moments in the game where, instead of using the knockout button on the stealth mechanics, I used the kill function. I wondered as to why, because I knew when I had clicked that button that it had felt 
uncharacteristic. I had made it an unaddressed point to not kill anyone during the stealth sections. And specifically, I made it a point just to not use the kill function. But in this section, I did, and that very choice added a great deal of depth to the way I positioned myself in relation to the game. You don't lose any moral points if you kill, I mean, it depends in certain sections, but here you don't. Nothing really happens, but it felt weighty, like I had done something significant, and that was only bolstered by the way that I, that I had interacted with the game. It was a brief moment akin to a psychoanalytic slip of the tongue where my desire was jolted awake in front of me. I had built a pattern on handling these sections, and I had done something different from my usual path, and I noticed. It's an experience that doesn't really happen to me when playing games. I don't know if a keyboard slip is even a thing, but it was startling when I recognized it. You spend a very long time killing bandits until you eventually destroy Regina and are forced to proceed on foot. Artyom finds a small ferry, if it can be called that, to Venice. He has to fight off a pack of Nosaluses and escapes. Here, we are introduced to another new enemy type called the Shrimp. We traverse this new coastal part of the metro with Groucho Marx and arrive in Venice. I spent nearly an hour in Venice, just sitting around and listening to conversations. It's one of the more fully realized stations in the game, and it feels vibrant and alive. And this section is bolstered by the Children of Men point I made earlier. You can very easily continue the main plot and be out of this area in 5 to 10 minutes flat, but if you treat this as an opportunity to get invested in the world, it really feels like a genuinely incredible experience. You find Pavel, he's working with a local gang, Drop your weapon. and you eventually catch up with him and he escapes. You travel via the swamps to the nearby church, which is a ranger outpost. Now, I don't feel especially qualified to talk about graphical fidelity or anything of the sort, you know, anything related to art design, but I can give my opinion on what this game looks like, especially the Redux edition. It's gorgeous. The level design and graphical fidelity in these outdoor areas really are a sight to behold. They're bombed out, destroyed, and ruined. The creature design here is also really fun, and you get your first taste of the boss fights in the game. I'll be honest, I'm of two minds with the boss fights. On one hand, I don't actually like the boss fights in this game. I think they're mainly ammo drains and take away from a lot of the tension and momentum of the main plot. But I really love the monster design. I'm a horror fanatic, and I love paying attention to the creature design in horror films and games. I think the Metro series has some twisted looking monsters that look and sound incredible. These shelled shrimp adjacent creatures are definitely a part of that, and I also think they're just a good deal of fun to fight. They introduce mechanical twists like flanking and C4 to keep this area feeling fresh. This is also where that first conversation that I mentioned, D6, about the ranger who strayed too far from the red flags, becomes relevant as a piece of environmental and mechanical storytelling. You will learn how navigation of the swamps works after some trial and error, but it felt really good when I was able to recall that piece of information and use it for a series of levels that occur some five hours later. Artyom has a boss fight with another mantis-like monster, and you and some of the rest of the rangers work to cut it down. You defeat the beast and hole up in the church. Some time later, Lesnitsky and a unit of red soldiers breaks into the church and kidnaps Anna as a bargaining chip for peace negotiations occurring in Polis. Artyom chases after them through the catacombs of the dilapidated church. You have another boss fight, and much like the aforementioned ones, they are mechanically unsatisfying and simplistic. There's usually one novelty in each of these boss fights. With this bo boss fight in the catacombs, the monster has a charging attack. There are pillars located around the arena that, if you stand near them, the monster will charge into them and slowly accumulate massive brain injuries. Eventually, you kill the monster, which unleashes a massive tidal wave. You wind up in the tunnels on the outskirts of Octobataskaya, and as you navigate the dingy and cramped air ducts, you see, through crooked slits, the red line. They're here. They are killing infected civilians. Civilians that you will come to learn who become infected through the release of a bioweapon by the red line. This is a genuinely unsettling moment in a game, a series, that is built on the development of unsettling moments. It's so scary because it shows the depths and depravity of ideology. And I think it cements that these first two games in the series are about the true depravity of the human spirit when snatched in the safe and comfortable arms of ideology. 
anything is acceptable. As you maneuver through the crumbling ruins of Octavodaskaya, you find burnt bodies, mass graves, men and women and children who've lined up, face the wall, and riddled with bullets, painting the drab stone and wood in red. At the end of this level, you're faced with a moral choice, but one that I couldn't even allow myself to properly consider, not until after the fact. Lesnitsky holds Anna captive. He tells you to remain calm or he will kill Anna. He wanted Artyom to... I'll be honest, I didn't even care about what he was going to say next. I just started shooting. And after that was over, after Lesnitsky ducks to the side and Anna and Artyom retreat into Hansa, I had to sit with that for a minute, again. There were these brief flashes where my conscious will to not kill, to retain a quasi-pacifistic run, was subverted by the almost primal enjoyment that I would derive in seeing Lesnitsky gone. That made me legitimately uncomfortable, but I think it goes to show just how intimately linked and stained, when staged appropriately, our desire is in the way that we perceive an image. Lesnitsky went from being someone that I would stop to being someone that carried a gigantic kill sign over his head. This is a part of those brief moments where the Metro series can really pull something out of you if you decide to get viscerally sucked into its world. And I think this is an important conversation to have, specifically when we're talking about Metro. When people talk about Metro, I've read lots of reviews and seen lots of videos about it, there's always that conversation about immersion about a resounding sense of realism. But I don't think people try to theorize what immersion actually does in the context of playing the game. It does more than make you believe that you're just in the game. Quoting Todd McGowan again, and I want to preface that this is in reference to the works of David Lynch, but I find the abstract connections to be startlingly precise. Quote, the cinema is no longer an escape without any, any connection to the outside world, nor is it a reality unto itself. Instead, it is the reverse side of that outside world, the phantasmatic underside that holds the truth of the latter." End quote. I would tweak this slightly and say that certain precisely psychologically investing and well-done video games holds the fantasy key to unlocking the truth about certain traumas that exist in the outside world. The medium and the world it is produced in are intimately linked. So in the case of Metro, quoting McGowan again, quote, we escape into the trauma that remains hidden, but nonetheless structures the outside world, end quote. The swirling vortex of ideology that Artyom slowly attempts to disentangle himself from is a grueling process, but I'll argue later that I don't think the game goes far enough in pursuing this point. After this encounter with Lesnitsky, Artyom and Anna begin a romantic relationship. I'll be honest in saying that in the context of this story, I don't think there's enough time devoted to actually fleshing this out. The relationship between these two characters, I mean. Over the course of the entire game, they maybe have a total of 7 to 10 minutes of screen time, and this is in a 10 and a half to 12 and a half hour game. This moment is probably the closest the uh, storytelling comes to Metro 2033. Things are simply happening to Artyom, and it feels forced. I think this could have been fixed in a relatively easy way. One level post-Bog Monster fight where the two have to work together. You could show in a mechanical way Artyom's growing appreciation and fondness for Anna. The two could complete certain puzzles or combat encounters where the two of them have to work together in a way unlike any of the other companion characters. Now, I don't say this lightly, and I say relatively because there may be legitimate reasons within the scope of the budget or the engine that they could not account for a scene like this, but I think something like it, while half-baked and still rushed, could at least set up a burgeoning, blossoming relationship that can get at least a little bit more explored in this game and get further explored in Exodus. After this sequence, you get to see the aftermath of the Octavodaskaya disaster. Men, women, and children huddled into quarantine chambers, isolated from one another. They're alone. They cough and plead for dear life. The death toll rises, all the while the medical staff seeks to comfort those in pain during their final moments. This scene is what made me want to start this series of lecture videos on the Metro series to begin with. These scenes are especially poignant, now more than ever, and when I say now, I mean during the time of this writing. 
And in an effort to not sorely date this video, if you don't know what I'm referring to, just look up the coronavirus. Now, the only reason that I think this scene is especially poignant is because even in the darkness and grimness of this scene, even with the horrific conditions of the Hansa station, with their mass exploitation of all of the people here seeking medical supplies, there's a resounding sense of solidarity. Artyom links up with Khan again, and from this point forward we have some of the most engaging content in the first two series of games. Khan instructs Artyom to find the River of Fate, which will lead him to the location of the Dark One. There's also this great reference to the Tarkovsky stalker film with this telephone line that should not be working, but rings nonetheless. Khan and Artyom are swept away by the River of Fate. Lending towards the point I made 13 hours ago in this video, this is one of those incredible moments where the game prioritizes perspectival shifts, seeing things from other perspectives. And with the context of all that we've learned about the Dark Ones, and specifically watching the missiles strike from down on the ground, to see the ending of Metro 2033 unfold again carries a dreaded despair. We want to stop it. We want to change it. But we cannot. The river provides us with an opportunity to make some semblance of amends, to cleanse our sins. The water is dropping off. Khan and Artyom ride a motorcycle in a high pursuit chase, and Artyom jumps onto the train. In my previous video on 2033, I discussed the awful turret section. I still stand by it. I think that section is truly awful. The entire section is awkward, clunky, and mechanically unsatisfying, and in Last Light's efforts to retread many of the events from 2033, it remixes that same scene. But it makes it legitimately exciting, and narratively consequential. Once you save the Baby Dark One, it is revealed to Artyom that he was in fact the chosen bridge between the Dark Ones and humanity. An intimate link exists between Artyom and those who he very nearly slaughtered. And the journey of Artyom closely parallels the story of the Dark One, but Artyom is able to make amends, to attempt to right his previous wrong. On a metatextual level, this nicely mimics the journey of 4A games, who attempt to retread and recontextualize the entire narrative of Metro 2033, and add a degree of narrative depth and gravitas to what was a previously underwhelming game. The next section of the game has Artyom traveling to Polis with the Dark One. This part is straightforward, but there's a lot of really incredible levels that happen in between here. But again, simply put, Artyom and the Dark One travel to Polis. That's what happens. Depending on several key decisions that Artyom makes in these chapters, this will determine your ending, and the state of Artyom and the Dark Ones moving forward. The first of these levels that I really loved was Bridge. It's a level that I think perfectly addressed an issue that I previously voiced with Metro 2033. Specifically, the 2033 did not prioritize stealth outside of the interaction with human enemies. In Bridge, you can complete the entire level without killing a single enemy. And on Rager difficulty, this was difficult, but fulfilling and rewarding. I loved it. I implore all of you watching that if you have any interest in playing this game, that you try and play Ranger difficulty. As far as I see it, this is the most narratively and mechanically consistent game mode, and adds a level of tension to the entire experience. The Ranger difficulty also elevates the entire next section, which is another ambush stealth combat gauntlet organized by the Red Line. Ranger difficulty simply makes ammo and filters scarcer, pushing you to conserve your ammunition for later combat encounters. There were also some really awful moments here with the enemy AI that uh, they were just truly terrible, but it didn't ruin the experience too much. We'll see how, how uh, Metro pushes their stealth mechanics forward in Exodus, but for now, they're working with what they've got. At the end of this gauntlet, we find Lesnitsky, and it suddenly struck me in this scene what the main theme of Metro Last Light was. It's not subtle, but it allows you to put it into action here. Redemption. How are we to say that Artyom is worthy of redemption after his near extinction of an entire species? Is Lesnitsky worthy of this same treatment? I had to think about my previous actions place them side by side with the entire thematic purpose of this game, and think. I decided to spare Le Lesnitsky, and it felt fitting. I felt the same way after the Pavel encounter later in the game, 
The game provided you with two opportunities to put into practice this thematic emphasis on redemption. And I think this is where the choice system really shines. It asks you, were you paying attention? Did you think that only you were allowed redemption? It's this level of dynamic choice, a choice that does not fully announce itself, but tests your comprehension of the text that makes this really special. And while we're here, I want to briefly talk about that fight with Pavel. This section is somewhat terrible. It's a big courtyard shootout with a bunch of the boys from the Red Line. If you're not paying careful attention, you can get absolutely torn up in this section, and I died more than a few times. But the part of this fight that really drained my health and my patience was the final crawl up to Pavel. Pavel waits at the top of the stairs, firing his precise hit-scanned gun, which can kill you almost instantaneously. You'll have to do this firing up the stairs nonsense three times before you eventually whittle him down. What's so disappointing about this section is that the mechanical frustrations get in the way of one of the most powerful moments in the game. The baby dark one tells Artyom, after you've fired the last shot, that Pavel feels regret and sadness. You realize, or at least I did, that Pavel is still a person. He's not just some lame action movie villain, he feels awful that he's been put in a position where he had to kill someone that he considered a friend. And that's heartbreaking. The arc of Pavel is long and filled with tragedy. But the game asks you again here, is Pavel worthy of redemption? If you decided to kill Lesnitsky but save Pavel, then the chances of you getting the alternate ending of the game is basically set in stone. But if you reverse it and choose to kill Pavel, still a chance of you getting the canonical ending. I racked my brain for a while thinking about that, and I've come to a conclusion. I think killing Lesnitsky is easy. Killing Pavel still has some conflict attached to it. There's so many signposts that, in a different life, under different circumstances, Artyom and Pavel could have actually been good friends. The choice to kill him is difficult. With Lesnitsky, killing him is easy. And if you do it, you never have to confront the game's main theme. Is Lesnitsky really not worthy of redemption? If you saved Pavel, but killed Lesnitsky, I think it's fair to say that you have to sit with that choice. What made one life worthy of redemption, but the other not? Players will be more inclined to kill Lesnitsky because you spend all of three minutes with him, and he's just cartoonishly evil. But the same logic can be applied to Artyom. The Dark Ones only ever tried to communicate with him, and he blew them up. Why would they come to your rescue in the ending? You've basically just shown them, you've basically just shown the baby dark one, that people aren't worth saving. Eventually, you find out that there are dark ones hidden in D6. After you navigate through the mind palace of Comrade Moscovin and Polis, he announces that the Red Line is currently undertaking an assault on D6. Artyom and company rush to the base. In the canonical ending, the dark one says that it will return with help. In the alternate ending, the Dark Ones do not arrive, and Artyom dies. Either way, Artyom and the rest of the Rangers must defend it. I think this section of this conclusion is generally weak and mind-numbing. I got tired of the mindless, repetitive combat fairly quickly, picking up the various turrets that are lying around and the snipers. It's just not a very fun section, but there's some great set piece moments here, especially when a tank rolls out and you have to shoot it down. Even that though, as some type of almost final boss fight, is kind of bland, and I didn't think it was an especially fitting end to such a great game. But even though this final combat encounter was a letdown, I think the game ends with a really beautiful scene. It succinctly encapsulates the entire story of the Dark Ones, but again, I don't think that it goes far enough. And this will be the last point that I really have to make, but I think it's a necessary one, just as a critique of the story. I personally think that the Dark One should have stayed. I think that would have made the point of learning to live with sin and difference much clearer, it would have been genuinely unique to see the last remnants of humanity coexist with this new species. Their children, as Artyom slightly remarks in the final journal entry. But I also understand that this just might not have been the story they were telling, and that's fine. But I think that with this 
uh, recontextualization, they would have stuck the landing just a little bit harder. I want to conclude this video with a question, one that stuck with me throughout the course of my playing. The title for the last game was very straightforward, it's Metro 2033, that's it. But I kept trying to rack my brain around, what was the last light? And I've seen a lot of interesting responses, and I think I agree with some more than others. So there are a few ways that we can read this eponymous last light. One argument that I've seen is that Artyom is the last light of humanity. Another position is that the Dark Ones are the last light of humanity, the savior. But I've also seen the argument that the Order itself is the last light, and I think of the three, I disagree with that final point the hardest. I definitely don't think that the Order is the savior of humanity, and I think that the game takes into careful consideration just the problems with the Order, even though it has this veneer of being the savior. Now, I think I fall more into the camp of the, la of the Last Light operating as a proper dialectical reversal. It is only through the darkest, murderous zero point which Artyom finds himself at the end of 2033 that he's able to encounter the radical contingency of the Dark Ones and their position. He realizes that that which he sought to destroy was an inextricable part of himself. It was only through this that he could rediscover his humanity, a part that he had repressed, but which had returned with a greater force and tenacity. It is only at the end of the Last Light that Artyom is able to hold true and consider his position as a chosen human and a dark one. It is in this position of the Absolute that Artyom and the rest of the Metro can move forward, can progress. It is only once we hold true to the radicality of the contradictory position and operate from that framework that we can attempt to escape the intoxicating pitfalls of ideology. This is also why the final entry in the series, on a thematic and narrative level, is internally consistent with Artyom rediscovering his humanity and cleansing his sins and existing in this new space. He is able to have the world unfurl before him, and he's able to truly rebuild. Overall, of the last two Metro games, and maybe even of the entire series, Last Light holds a special place in my heart. It was because of this game that I went and played the Stalker series. It was because of this game that I fell in love with the weird world of Russian post-apocalyptic literature. A weird subgenre, to say the least, but one that Metro goes to painstaking depths to stay true to. I really do recommend all of you to go play this game. I also recommend all of you to go and play it, and tell me that I made this game way too overly complicated. Also, if there is anyone interested in reading some of the literature that I used for this video, I'll be leaving uh, links down in the description box below, uh, so that if you are interested in reading the Todd McGowan book, The Impossible David Lynch, as well as the original Metro books, I'll be leaving those there for you. Overall, I just hope that this experiment worked, and that, at the very least, even if you unapologetically disagree with me, that I made a compelling video on a game that hasn't had many of those. For those of you that are interested in the future content coming out on this channel, I'm working through a video on Disco Elysium that should be out in the coming weeks, as well as the final chapter of the Metro series. Uh, after these two videos, um, considering doing a deep dive into Fallout 76 Wastelanders, but at this point I'm pretty much open to doing anything. So if there's anything that you would like me to cover, or if there's any critiques about this video, or anything that you'd just like to discuss in the comments, just leave them down below. Thanks for watching.